I'm working on this in the hope that by understanding the gender binary's roots, we will be able to undermine it more successfully. But I'm also beginning to see that clearing the gender binary is also likely to uproot a lot of other things, racial things, economic things, military things that might seem unrelated. Here we go in uh, three big steps. Uh, first step, Europe starts exporting large quantities of silver to Asia and Africa. Uh, the unification of the Persian Empire in the late 500s BC was soon followed by an expansion of African and Asian trade, what we call the Silk Road and the Spice Trade or the Indian Ocean Trade. As trade increased, vast new supplies of currency were needed to facilitate trade. Various solutions were found, including increased use of cowrie shells and letters of credit, but there was also a sudden surge in the demand for silver. We can see this shortage in the low silver content of Indian punch marked silver coins issued by Alexander's satraps and their successors. They are no more than 86% silver and often as low as 68%, which is very low. In addition to opening uh, silver mines in Asia, for example, at Dariba and Agucha in Northern India, Asian traders also were now willing to pay high prices for silver from European mines. Large amounts of silver were exported from Europe to Asia and Africa. Chemical tests of Asian silver of this period show its Greek origin. Uh, Pliny the Elder complains twice that silver is flowing out of Europe to India and huge mines were being opened in Europe. Tens of thousands of enslaved men worked at Laurion near Athens in the 500s and 400s BC. Silver mines in Thrace were also exploited. As the mines at Laurion began to give out, Carthaginian and then Roman exploitation of the silver mines in Spain, like Rio Tinto, picked up. These mines probably employed more than 40,000 enslaved workers. They operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, probably in two long, horrible shifts. Pliny warned that the work was in addition toxic. Uh, and that's not actually because of lead poisoning, it's because of uh, some gas that the Galena ore gives off. Uh, as a result of forcing all this work and selling all this silver, European elites became much wealthier than they had been before, giving rise to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome, though most of the wealth of the empire remained in the Asian provinces and Egypt. Okay, second step. Up to this time and continuing in Asia and Africa, work and money are kind of fluid and gender binaries are also pretty fluid. In Asia and Africa, silver was only one of many in antiquity. The oldest and perhaps the most used, I don't have a picture of, uh, was shells, especially cowrie shells, which were mostly harvested by women in the Maldive islands of the Indian Ocean, and which circulated from East Africa as far as Indonesia and Southern China. Beads, which you see here, and in this period, especially glass beads, were also a common currency. Uh, they were produced in India, in Egypt, and in Syria, and also circulated widely from Korea to the Sahara, England, and the Baltic. Uh, and you can see a, a map of the global distribution of Indo-Pacific Indo beads. This is from late antiquity, but I don't think it's that different uh, a little earlier. Uh, as a larger denomination currency, textiles were also uh, commonly used uh, to pay debts to settle uh, discrepancies in trades. Um, in China, it's bolts of silk, of course. In India, block printed cotton. In the Parthian Empire, wool tapestry and the ancestors of Persian carpets. And in Egypt, bolts of fine linen. Some of these textiles uh, were worn uh, and you know they some of them are worn and then used as currency, some of them are used as currency and then worn, but there are also just piles of unused cloth that were stored in chests, on shelves, in standardized sizes and qualities that are just stockpiled and used as, uh, as wealth and traded as wealth, but never really intended to be used. 
For the sake of time, I won't go into detailed evidence that all of these currencies were still in use in antiquity. I'll just remind you that trade cloth and Indian beads were still widely used in the 19th and even into the 20th century in India and West Africa and throughout North America. That's when, you know, if you played with Indian beads as a child or something, those, they're not called Indian beads because Native Americans played with them. They're used them. They're called Indian beads because they were made in India. Or not probably the ones you played with as a child, but uh, in general. Um, these shell bead and textile currencies were mainly produced by women. Uh, many were enslaved in workshops ranging from as few as five or six to a thousand or more women. Uh, and here you see two different uh, examples of uh, these workshops from opposite ends of uh, our period, roughly. Uh, and uh, some are work so some are working in these workshops, others are doing piecework at home. This money was therefore feminized as something that was produced by women, even though the traders who used it in their transactions were probably mostly the same men who used European silver. Silver, though often used in the form of coins, was also often weighed and used as bullion. I don't think, therefore, that it was the invention of coinage that drove this new demand for silver. Nor did Asian traders racialize silver as European. As Asian and African traders and their customers used silver and other currencies more or less indifferently, in the same way they were also fairly indifferent to gender and race binaries. This is again clear from our sources. Jewelry and fancy clothing were barely gendered in Asia inside or outside the borders of the Roman Empire. Men often dressed elaborately as you see in funerary banqueting reliefs from Palmyra Hegehotep, a minor Egyptian god of weaving, changes his gender easily into being a goddess uh, over time. Julian the Apostate and John Chrysostom give us the people of Antioch with their soft and delicate way of living, their love of the theater, dancers, music, warm baths and beds, men and women both shaving their whole bodies. And John Chrysostom is specifically addressing the uh, homosexuality, the queerness of uh, Antiochians, which is apparently fabled. Uh, women like Hatshepsut, Cleopatra VII, Julia Maesa, Zenobia held power in the East and sometimes expressed it by being depicted as men. Okay, so silver pouring out of Europe, that's our first step. Uh, the East being much less concerned with uh, gendering and uh, uh, dialectic uh, than uh, Europe. That's our second step. Now we'll go back to the Europeans again for a third step where Europeans insist that money isn't feminized work, but a masculine abstraction. So uh, Greeks and Romans did not follow the Asian and African line that all of these forms of currency were interchangeable. Instead, they reconceptualized this masculinized money as distinct from feminized goods, so that Roman writers like Pliny can say that the Romans buy clothing and jewelry with money, but they don't sell anything themselves. Like they're just completely in denial that they're selling silver, right? They're like, we, we buy linen and beads and silk, but we don't sell anything. We just buy them with money. Right. Uh, Roman jurors also emphasize this distinction between money and goods uh, in Roman law codes, we see it. Uh, and, you know, discussions of Roman law. And the idea goes as far as a first century AD Roman graffito from Pompeii, which takes the same attitude. Uh, the graffito says, I hate the poor, ask for freebies, you're a jerk give coppers, get stuff. So again, give money as if it's nothing, get stuff as if that's a completely different thing. Silver instead becomes associated in Europe with weapons, which are also made of metal. And you see those weapons depicted on the coins here. As Amy Lather has shown, and I, I'm just working my way through Amy Lather's new book, and I'm not sure that I 
understand everything about it correctly yet, but the shininess, the poikileia of gleaming spears becomes associated with the shininess of coins, right? Weapons and coins are both made of metal. And uh, writers begin to imagine coins as tiny soldiers defending the city, while they also imagine citizen soldiers as giant coins, right? There's this kind of association. The purity of silver makes good money, while the purity of bloodlines makes good soldiers, right? So they both have to be pure in order for the city to succeed. Uh, Euripides, for example, has Medea in a play that really centers on citizenship complain, why did you, this is Medea, why did you grant men clear signs to show if gold is counterfeit, while when one seeks to discern the wicked man, no stamp exists on his body. Aristophanes at the end of the 400s BC writes of wretched men, falsely struck, dishonorable, counterfeit, and lacking in native quality. So again, counterfeit as if like falsely struck men as coins. Demosthenes in the mid 300s BC associates men who betray their city again with false coins. Naturally citizenship then is limited to men, <coughs> sorry, and forbidden to immigrants even in subsequent generations, right? Because they're not made of metal, right? They're not made of silver, they can't. They're like false coins. In theory, of course, not always in practice. Roman sources take the same attitude. In Horace, money is a weapon to get a desirable wife. Cicero and Tacitus name money as one of the arma that you need for war. Juvenal describes silver sliced into tiny faces. Uh, so there's, again, this, this uh, comparison between the men of the city and the coins of the city. So silver is in this way European, Europeanized and masculinized. Europeans contrasted their silver money with other forms of currency that they then queered and racialized. They mocked the linen, silk, and uh, beads that they were importing as jewelry as signs of queerness and cowardice. Both Curtius and Plutarch, for example, contrast Alexander of Macedon's clean living with Persian effeminate luxury. Julius Caesar was taunted with a supposed queer relationship he had in Bithynia in Asia, which is associated with a golden couch arrayed in purple. Horace writes of the Parthian who is courageous when galloping away, right, because he's a coward. In Horace's Cleopatra Ode, as Ellen Oliensis puts it, Horace casts the Battle of Actium as a battle between the central Roman self and its marginalized other, between East and West, man and woman, virtus and impotentia, reason and passion, Republican liberty, and monarchical enslavement. Europeans cast Asian and African gender flexibility as something negative. Seneca complains that we can dress ourselves without any trade with China. On a wall painting from Pompeii, here it is, uh, Heracles has to dress like a woman and spin thanks to Queen Omphale in uh, Anatolia who wears his lion skin and takes his club. So there's this cross. Uh, that's what happens to you if you go to Asia, right? You become feminized and you have to make cloth. It's been 15 minutes. Thank you, Karen. I'm getting there. Thank you. Uh, so why is this? Why do they do this? To keep from being feminized, to promote the use of silver? I think no. I think this attitude is mainly inherent in the use of silver. Uh, it's something about the business of, of selling silver. I think Europeans do this to maintain the value of silver without risk of debasement as a practical solution to a real problem. As we've seen, the gender of money was not an issue in Asia or Africa, nor was it an issue in Iron Age Greece or Etruria. When Homer's Menelaus and Helen stop in Egypt to get generous presents from the wealthy rulers there, there's no sense of negativity. The Odyssey has some remarks on Phoenician traders, but as John Coldstream and more recently Mark Peacock have pointed out, there's little real negativity beyond the anti-Semitism of generations of Homerists. In Iron Age Europe, women appear as useful though devious producers, spinning and weaving, often for sale, as we see from their scales weaving the wool, uh, weighing the wool. If you see, uh, 
I'm not, yeah, in some of these images, you see them weighing the wool for uh, production, and, and that's not necessary if you're doing it at home. Uh, and notice that they're all, except one, uh, black figure. These are from before they, they're really selling silver. Uh, the last one is really a, an exception, the Penelope one. Uh, and that's from the 400s, about 450. Um, but in the last centuries BC, women are instead start to be presented as greedy and demanding. The first Greek phase to depict uh, Eriphyllis necklace buying her corrupt support of, to send her husband to the seven against Thebes is from about 450 BC. So around the same time that that last Penelope uh, weaving image is being made. Euripides Hippolytus uh, describes the wife as the poison flower. Her husband laughs to hang jewels on the deadly thing he joys in, labors for her robe wearing till wealth and peace are dead. So now women are consumers while men are producers. Uh, the women of Menander's place want necklaces and fine dr dresses bought for them. They don't make robes and give them the way, the way Iron Age, Helen, or Arete do. The conservative Roman politician Cato the Elder scolds women as consumers of uh, imports from abroad. By the last centuries of the Republic, Romans were passing sumptuary laws blaming women for these imports. The Lex Appia in 215 BC said that women couldn't own more than half an ounce of gold or wear multicolored dresses, especially purple ones. Again, Tacitus has Tiberius complain about the specially female extravagance by which for the sake of jewels, our wealth is transported to alien or hostile countries. The early Christian authors, Tertullian, Cyprian, Clemens, all blame women for luxury as well. As Oliensis suggests, European and Europeans in the classical period connected silver money to representative government. This idea that coins like citizens were naturally part of a democratic or Republican government was I think important to the success of European silver on the Asian and African market. Not all European coined money was equally welcome. The coins that succeeded were those that could be trusted to maintain a high silver content and didn't have to be weighed and assayed with a touchstone coin and the Roman silver denarius. Both were the product of government systems with multiple checks and balances and both generally succeeded in preventing the debasement of their coins. All of these things then are connected. Europeans constructed their strict gender binary to help them sell silver. To sell, silver had to be pure. To keep silver pure, Europeans developed governments with checks and balances and an ideology equating pure silver coins with the pure bloodlines of male citizen soldiers. This ideology in turn led to the marginalization of women and foreigners and so to gender and race binaries. Lessons for today. These ideas are still with us and not by accident. With regard to the ancient world, they still distort our thinking. We still feminize ancient Asian production as the Silk Road and the spice trade. As the anthropologist Maurice Bloch has said, modern scholars often seem to fetishize money as some kind of special, separate, immutable concept, as opposed to the imagined fluidity of gift exchange, for example. Uh, Richard Seifert moves beyond this to imagine that the abstraction of money led to the abstraction of philosophy and pre-Socratic metaphysics. Uh, money is said to help promote the capacity for abstract thought and rational calculation here set in opposition to non-Europeans who are unable to apparently engage in abstract thought. And, and in case it's not clear that this is false, I'll just point out that Euclid was born in Africa and spent his entire life there. So it's false. Uh, as far as our own times, finally, the United States and Europe still run a thriving export business in currency, although now it's mainly $100 bills and electronic transactions. Something like 80% of all US $100 bills are currently outside the United States. The popularity of these currencies rests on their stability and people's confidence in the bills holding their value. That in turn rests on the nature of the US and uh, EU and so forth governments, British governments, which have a lot of checks and balances in place to prevent autocrats from messing up the currency. That's the money side. On the work side, most of our manufacturing takes place in Asia. 
China alone produces more than half the world's glass and steel, about a third of the world's plastic and cotton, et cetera. A lot of our queer phobia and racism is still tied up in this economic distinction. American and European stereotypes still feminize and queer Asian men. There's still a general American sense that the best monetary policy is hard and a hawkish, while worker-friendly policies are feminine or queer. Country music still rejects urbanism and luxury for the simple life. Women are still stereotyped as spending money men earn. Uh, recent white supremacist ban the gay bills must be seen in this larger and economic and historical context stretching back to antiquity. Uh, but we should realize that undoing dangerous homophobia like this may mean also changing a lot of other things. Thank you. <laughs>